Hi, this is Sam Weigel with V1 Rotate coming to you from Copala State Airport, the lower 48's only public beach airport. This week we're going to talk about flying classic tail draggers and what relevance these old birds might have for you, the newer aspiring professional pilot. I am not a bush pilot, nor have I ever been one, and I don't plan to be one in the future. I'm an airline pilot, it's what I've done for a living for 18 years now, and it's what I hope to do for another 24 before I retire. But, away from the big iron, on my own time, I like nothing better than to hop in a 60 or 70 year old tube and fabric tail rigger and explore our beautiful country the way our grandfathers did, low and slow. When I was learning to fly, I flew strictly boring airplanes. The Cessna 150, the 172, Piper Warriors and Arrows and Seminoles, Archers and Senecas. I did fly a Super Decathlon bit for spin training in college, but it wasn't until I was a regional airline captain that I was really introduced to tail draggers. Logan Weck learned to fly in gliders and old tail draggers as a teen, and when we flew together at Compass, he was part of a 12-person flying club formed around a 1946 Piper Cub. After our trip, he took me flying in the Cub, and it was a revelation. If you've never been in a Cub, you owe it to yourself to beg, buy, or steal a ride in one. The J-3 is the world's worst airplane for every conceivable mission except one. Flying low and slow with the door open on a beautiful summer evening. For that, it's the best airplane in the world. Logan gave me my tailwheel endorsement in the Cub, and when he moved away to Chicago, he sold me his share in the Yellow Cub Club. I had many great adventures in that airplane, including racing it in the Air Venture Cub. I was also in an informal flying club around a 1949 Cessna 170A for several years, and then my wife and I bought a 1953 Piper Pacer. That was probably the squirreliest tail dragger I've flown, it was quite sharp coupled, but it was a great adventure machine. We took our Pacer all over the US, to the Bahamas, and to Baja, Mexico. But then we sold it, to buy a sailboat to live aboard and cruise the Caribbean for a few years. When we moved off the boat and out to Washington State, one of my first moves was to get checked out in a Piper Cherokee, which, while a good, reliable four-seat airplane, is a bit boring. Shortly after that, I got checked out in a Cytabria, and then my neighbor Ken started borrowing me his Super Cub. Good neighbor, huh? I didn't want to abuse his generosity, so we used the airplane about once a month on local missions. We missed having an airplane of our own, though. I didn't mean to buy an airplane before our hangar was built, but just after we got home from Oshkosh, we stumbled upon this 1946 Stinson 108. Our neighbor Kyle had just finished a multi-year restoration of an airplane that hadn't flown since the 60s, with new fabric, paint, interior, glass, and a newly overhauled engine and prop. And despite the crazy used aircraft market, we got a great deal on it. I couldn't resist. In the month since, we've already started using our airplane to explore neat corners of our home state, flying it to lunch at Tacoma and dinner in the San Juan Islands, and a beach day here at Copalis. So, okay, you say, we get it, Sam. You're a rich airline pilot who's bored of being a rich airline pilot, and you like to play around with old light planes. But what does this have to do with me, the newer aspiring professional pilot? Well, I'm glad you asked. Remember when I flew all those boring airplanes at the start of my career? I didn't have a lot of extra money, and I was laser focused on getting my ratings and getting qualified for an airline job, just like a lot of you are. In the process, I got really burnt out, and if I hadn't already been so far in debt, there's a chance I would have quit flying after 9-11. A lot of my friends did. I've seen a lot of students get burnt out since. Flying can be a great career, but it's so cyclical and there can be so much hard work involved in getting to where it pays off that I think you'd be silly to do it for any reason other than a love of flying. But, like any other, this is a love that can be dull through repetition and drudgery. So, along with your focus on earning ratings and building hours and making yourself qualified for bigger and better things, remember to keep the fun in your flying. One of the best ways to do so is messing around in old tail draggers. This is seat of your pants flying, back to basics and stick and rudder, the way it was at the dawn of aviation. Most of the American boys who fought and died in the skies over Europe during World War II spent their first few hours in a J-3 Cub. Well into the 1960s, it was the most popular primary trainer, and I think it's worth pointing out that back then, the average first solo was at something like 8 hours. Flying tailwheel aircraft puts you in a lot of very good company, opens new opportunities, and comes with a built-in community of enthusiasts that really spans every generation. 
Because tail draggers center of gravity is behind their main gear, they are directionally unstable, some more than others. They force you to fly the right way in a way that many tricycle gear aircraft do not. Land with a little extra speed, and tail dragger will spit you back up in the air. Land with a little side load, be prepared for a little swerve that will become a big swerve if you don't do something about it. Most vintage aircraft were designed in the days before differential ailerons and other aerodynamic trickery, so they have a lot of adverse yaw. Above all, tail draggers really teach you how to use your feet properly. A big part of flying tail draggers is that it really invites you to explore cool places like this beach airport. It sparks adventure. Most of these places, quite honestly, you can take a bone stock 172 with the right skills, but the point is that flying tail draggers is a natural transition point for developing those skills and making you more comfortable with flying something other than a paved 4,000 foot lit runway with an ILS approach. But wait, you say, aren't stick and rudder skills passe for someone who just wants to fly airliners? Funny you should ask, industry has kind of come full circle on that one. Once upon a time when the airlines were going from 727s to 757s in Airbuses, stick and rudder skills were kind of taken for granted, and it was automation skills that were prized because so many of the old guys had trouble adapting to the new tech. But you've grown up with technology. You probably did your primary training in a glass cockpit airplane. I have every confidence in your ability to adapt to, say, an Embraer 175. The FOs I flew with, both at my last regional airline and my current major airline, are amazing at adapting to the technology. Uniformly amazing. You won't turn any heads being good at tech. I do, however, notice good stick and rudder skills, which is something that the industry is now putting a huge emphasis on after multiple crews have lost control of perfectly flyable airplanes over the last 15 years. Quite often, in my experience, the best sticks are those with tail draggers or gliders in their backgrounds, and especially those who continue to fly them on the side today. These guys and gales bring a lot of confidence to marginal situations. Dusty crosswinds on contaminated runways, OS turns for tight spacing, circling approaches, VFR patterns at small airports, unexpected go-arounds. Mind you, these occur on maybe 2% of flights, and they are rare opportunities to rise and shine and do pilot shit. Flying airliners won't improve these stick and rudder skills, it will degrade them. Flying tail draggers, on the other hand, will do a great deal to develop and hone these skills for the day you need them in your professional flying. One last thing, tail dragger flying can be a very cost effective way to build flight time. Some of the last good used aircraft deals around are classic tail draggers. Now, mind you, the higher powered, more bush capable aircraft like Super Cubs and Cessna 185s are stupid expensive, and even kit boxes have basically doubled in price the last few years. Thanks, Trent Palmer. But the 65 to 85 horsepower birds are still really reasonable to own or rent. And if you're looking to build flight hours, you don't really care how fast you're going. Yes, it's a bit more difficult finding tailwheel instructors and especially solo rental aircraft these days, but with a bit of sleuthing around the more rural corners of your state, accessible tail draggers are definitely out there. Thanks for watching. For more great content for new and aspiring professional pilots, join me here at flyingmag.com every first and third Friday of the month.